This week is known as the Passion Week. It's known as the week where the full display of Christ's love was for all to see. That as he entered his final week, there's a whole bunch of things that we can learn about how to finish well. There's a whole bunch of things that we can learn about preparing those around us even for finishing well. There's a whole bunch of things that we can learn mostly about the love of God that is so amazing that in his final days he'd be thinking about you and he'd be thinking about me. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Mark chapter 11? Here's the thing that I know about final weeks. When you come to what you would think would be the final week of your life on earth, trivial is irrelevant. Just the little mundane is not important. Everything in that last week, it's going to be vital. It's going to be crucial. You're only going to be doing the things that are absolutely necessary for moving forward. The things that don't matter and the things that don't need to address would be left behind. As you read about his final week, you'll, see, you'll feel his passion. You'll see him laugh as the children sing. You'll see, you'll see him weep as Jerusalem ignores their chance for peace. You'll feel his sadness as those whom he taught and loved betrayed and denied him. Emotions were high. You'll find Jesus crying. You'll find him laughing. You'll find him in agony. You'll find him weeping. Sweat, bloods, uh, sweat drops of blood. It's the full array of emotions. The last final week is not the week to leave anything behind. The final week is the week to put it all out on the table. And on the table, he lay. On the table, he lay. Last weeks are hard enough as they, as, just as they are. To think that this is the last time you're gonna do whatever you're doing, it's really hard. So now I add the burden of the sin of the whole world on your shoulders. And now you've taken it to a a level that I don't think any of us could understand. He walked the earth without sin. And now in that final week, the thought of bearing your sin and mine had him moving each day towards the cross. So we're going to look at this story You'll find it in Mark 11 to Mark 15. We're going to go through Monday to Friday. Here's what you need to know. Some of the days, we know that all these things happened in these days, but some of the days we don't exactly know whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday. We're not exactly sure. It's irrelevant. But we know for sure that on Sunday he he would come from Jericho to Jerusalem On the weekend, on the Saturday, Sunday, he would come from Jericho to Jerusalem and he would come in to ride on a donkey and come down that pathway into Jerusalem. And I've got some footage for you. If you just go to the... This is the the pathway from Jericho to Jerusalem. It doesn't look like much of a pathway. Can you press pause for a second, Daniel? I want you to look at this. This is the exact same place where when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he would come. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, this is the place between Jericho and Jerusalem where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. What happened? He was baptized in water and he went into the wilderness And he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And here's what happened. As he left the wilderness, he began his ministry on earth. So don't lose the significance now that before he's about to enter the greatest ministry that he would ever accomplish on your behalf and on mine, that he would have to face the very same place that he had had to walk 
three years earlier or maybe two and a half. If I'd had my greatest kind of temptation and then as I knew I was going into this final hurrah and I had to walk through the same path with every step deciding, will I go keep walking? Will I continue on? Can you keep press play there, Daniel, for me? It's not exactly an easy place. It's rocky, it's hilly. This is one of the only times in Scripture that you'll see that Jesus was out in front leading. The rest of the time you, you, you read and he's surrounded by people, but you read, you read the Scriptures, you read the four account, he was leading out in front. Why? Every step of decision, I will not turn back. I am pressing on for the joy that is set before me. I'll endure what I have to endure. You were the joy. Your life was the joy that set before him. And as he entered right onto the top there in Bethany, and as he, as he was going to come down and he said to the two men, he said, go ahead and, and there'll be a man there. Ask him to use his donkey, use his foal. You know, as you go through scripture, oh, you can press pause, thanks. This is one of the only times that Jesus needs anything. The people needed to be fed, so he fed them. The man needed to be, his eyes opened, so he opened their eyes. But Jesus needed a donkey. And I was thinking, he still needs donkeys today. He still needs you and I today. And sometimes you think I'm being a bit derogatory. Well, I'm not a donkey. Well, I think we all have donkey moments for sure. But I'm not really talking about that. When a king would ride in on a horse, it was an act of war. When a king would ride in on a horse, as Jesus will one day, when he comes and he'll be riding on a white horse and he'll declare, this is the end, that will happen one day. But as he came on this Easter week, he rode in on a donkey. In Zechariah 9.9, Jesus was fulfilling the promise. In 1 Kings David was near death. And Solomon was said to be king, but one of the other brothers, there was a struggle and he was trying to usurp the authority. And David said, Solomon, go on to my donkey and ride through the town. And we will, you know, the people will declare you king. And so as Solomon rode through Jerusalem on a donkey, don't lose the significance that Jesus was declaring, I come in peace. The donkey was a sign. When a king came on a donkey, it means he was coming in peace and Jesus was declaring, I'm coming in peace. Jesus didn't need anything, but he needed a donkey and Jesus doesn't need anything, but he needs you. How else will he ride in to the situations and the circumstances of your world if you don't ride on in? How else will he go to the hairdresser and to the supermarket and to your workplace and your cubicle? How will, he, how will he go into the hospitals and the schools? How will he go unless you carry him? How will he go unless you, a person of peace, who carries the Prince of Peace, decides, I will go for you? How will he go? And as he came into Jerusalem on that final day, on that final Sunday, he stops along the route and he weeps for Jerusalem. When we were in Israel, we stopped at the place that they would say that Jesus stopped. And it's a place that you can see the entire city. You've got the Kidron Valley just below and it would enter into the city of Jerusalem. And as Jesus entered in, he paused and he wept over Jerusalem. And you know what he wept over? He wept for the fact that their peace had arrived, their king had arrived, and they missed it. Is Jesus crying for you? He 
if he looked at your life this morning? Is he weeping over the fact that week after week, maybe you sit here week after week, you look like you're a churchgoer, you look like you're a Christian, but you know your heart is far from him. Is Jesus weeping over the fact that he was right in front of you and you missed him and you ignored him? He wept over Jerusalem, over the city that he loved. He stops and he weeps. You know, on this very day, and I think I've mentioned this before, it was lamb selection day. In the Jewish culture, at that time, each household would choose a lamb. We're about to celebrate Good Friday and we'll conduct a Messianic Passover where we look at, as Paul described, Jesus is the Passover lamb. But on that lamb selection day, each family would choose a lamb. They would go to the temple and they would choose a lamb. And the lambs would come from Bethlehem. Don't lose any of the significance. Jesus is talking to you this morning. The Paschal lambs, the lambs that would be sacrificed, were specially bred. And they would come from Bethlehem. They would come to Jerusalem. And they were, they were sold to families who had come all in for this Passover celebration. And on that day, as Jesus comes down on a donkey, the Lamb of God, you can almost hear John the Baptist's words, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because here are these lambs on the other side coming into town and they will be sacrificed for the family. And they would go and they would choose a lamb. And after four, after the, after four days on the Thursday, They would come and the priest would say, do you love the lamb? And the priest would ask the head of the household three times, just like Jesus would ask Peter three times. Do you love me, Peter? And the priest would ask the head of the household, do you love the lamb? I mean, you picture this. You've gone and got a little lamb and then you take him home. I've got three kids. I can imagine them falling in love with this lamb and, oh, he's so cute. And they're feeding the lamb and all of a sudden you say, he's going to be dinner on Thursday. That's the reality. That's what it looked like. But they're falling in love with this lamb. And so they go, do you love the lamb? And if, if the father said, didn't say yes, they couldn't sacrifice the lamb. Jesus was literally saying, choose me. I'm the Lamb of God. Timothy Keller would say that this story from Genesis to Revelation is really a story all about the Lamb. And on Lamb Selection Day, Jesus was saying, choose me. I'll be your Lamb. Once for all time. Here we go. We're heading to Mon- uh, That was Sunday. We're heading to Monday. Jesus on Monday would go down to the temple. You'll notice at the end of Sunday, he goes down and he checks out what's happening. And then he goes back, probably, he goes back to Bethany, probably to where his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live. Probably back to his friend's place. He knew where to go when he needed comfort and needed rest. He didn't stay in Jerusalem. Found that really interesting. That he went all the way back, up the hill, back to his friends, back to Bethany. And as he um, then comes down on the Monday, he walks past the fig tree and he, he tells off a fig tree, curses the fig tree. And then he would go down into the temple and he would see that God's people were being ripped off. He would see that people were coming in for, for, they were coming in for Passover. And as they were coming in, people were making money. They were charging a temple tax. They were charging, they were getting specially bred doves. And they were convincing the people that if they brought a dove, that maybe it would be, um, you know, blemished by the time they, you know, they went to sacrifice it. And then their journey of days and days would be useless And so they would convince them to buy their doves, of course, at a special price. And Jesus was infuriated. 
He was infuriated that they would um, call his house anything than what it was meant to be. And he says, he kicks out the, the people that were, you know, going for money and going for this. And what does he say? My house will be called a house of prayer for all people. For all people. And Jesus is the same today. If you get on TV and you watch someone who's going after your money and they're, you can definitely know that that's not the heart of God. Jesus wasn't against money. In fact, coming up, he will come and he would sit at the collection box and he'd watch as people gave their offering. That's very different to being coerced and manipulated into giving. It infuriates the father when, when his house is called anything but a house of prayer. When his house is called anything but a place where people can come and worship and bring their hearts before him. And Jesus, it looks like he's having a temper tantrum as you read it in Mark 12. Uh, sorry, Mark 11. But he's not. He'd seen it the day before. He'd seen what they were doing to his house. And he comes in and he says, this should not be this way. This should not be this way. Your house. The scripture says that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? You are now the living temple of God. What's in your house? What, what's in your house? It's a good question for us to ask us all. Want to anger God? Get in the way of people who want to see him. Get in the way of the innocent. Exploit people in the name of God. Jesus was saying, I've had enough of this. Here we go, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, he talks in the temple. He talks about all kinds of things. He talks about faith. He talks about them being people of faith. He would go and describe the parable of the, ta the talents. He prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. And if you know history, you know that in AD 70 or around there, that the temple would be destroyed just as he had prophesied and just like he said. Interesting that that would be the end of the Jewish people, really. Well, in that, that era, in that time, it would be close to the end of the sacrificial system where people would come and sacrifice. Interesting that just after Jesus, the Jewish people would switch how they relate to him. Now, no more sacrifice. I want to suggest to you that it's because Jesus Christ came, one Peter would say, once for all time, for all our sin. There was no need for a perpetual sacrifice anymore because Jesus, Jesus, the Passover lamb, had ridden into town. He leaves the temple and he heads to the Mount of Olives. And I want you to turn to Mark 13, 32. I'm going to read it this morning in the Passion Translation. So here he's talking. He's talking about the Son of Man. He's talking about the fig tree. You know, over 80 times the term Son of Man was used and 80 times it was used by Jesus himself to describe himself. Have a look, 32. Concerning the day and exact hour, no one knows when it will arrive. Not the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father knows. This is why you must be waiting, watching and praying, because no one knows when the season or the time will come. What's he doing? He's preparing the people. He's preparing them for, their, for his return. He's preparing them because he won't be with them. And anyone who's had a final week knows that that's the time you do handover. That's the time where you leave what you know to the next crew. 
That's the time when you say, okay, what do they really need to know? And you go through all the things that you make sure that you've told them so that they'll succeed once you go. And Jesus is teaching them all in the temple. And then he goes up to Bethany. The scripture says that he, he waits on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was the place that he would go f- for private prayer. His secret place of prayer. And he would take them up there and he would talk. And behind his back, Judas then begins to scheme against Jesus. I think this is really interesting about the name of the name Judas. Here we go. It says the name Judas is actually Judah. Iscariot is not his last name. You know, we think Judas Iscariot and Iscariot is <laughs> his last name. Iscariot is not his last name. But could have been taken of the town of Kiriath, 12 miles, miles south of Hebron. More plausibly, it is from a Hebrew word meaning lock. Judah, the locksmith. Most likely, he was chosen to lock the collection bag, which means he had the key and could pilfer the funds at will. Sadly, he wanted to lock up Jesus and control him for his own ends. Scripture would tell us that he often, that he was upset that they were um, giving, they were giving to the poor and he was upset that the woman was being generous with Jesus. All the while, he had his hand in the money bag. All the while, he had the lock and key to the treasury. Then we get to Thursday. And Jesus celebrates the Passover meal. It's his final meal. Picture this. You've invited your closest friends, your closest people to come for dinner. They get to dinner. You sit the table. You spread the table. You have a lovely meal together. There's some amazing meal. We heard last week he washed their feet. This beautiful, beautiful moment. And then they have this kind of who's going to betray you kind of a moment. And then the disciples get into arguing about who will be the greatest. It's so typical of some of our tables. They end up so lovely. They start off so lovely and end up in a place we have no idea how they got there. All of a sudden, the disciples are arguing. Who's going to be the greatest? Is it me? Who's going to sit? And they're having this argument. And all he's trying to do is prepare them for when he's not here. And they want to know who's going to sit on the right and who's going to sit on the left. And who's the greatest amongst us? Meanwhile, there's one sitting at the table who knows full well that he had already set into motion that he would betray him. How would you be knowing that you'd invited a table and you had a traitor sitting at the table and you would now, in the most beautiful act of mercy, wash his feet? You would wash his feet knowing that he would betray you with a kiss. This love of God is unbelievable. This passion that he had for you and I that puts aside his own, surely, his own feelings. What a saviour. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Bit of a background and context, 30 pieces of silver was the exact amount that would be used to buy and sell slaves in that culture. Is that amazing? He was sold as a slave. Your king and mine. He was sold like it didn't matter. This Jesus. And for 30 pieces of silver, the going rate of a slave, Jesus was handed over. Before he was handed over, he'd go into the garden 
of Gethsemane. When we went on our tour of Israel, we all were given a location that we had to speak at. And the location I was given was the garden of Gethsemane. And as I stood amongst the olive, the olive grove there, I spoke to the women about betrayal, about those that are closest to you, those that you love the most, those that know the intimate intricacies of your heart. That's the reality for Jesus, for, for Judas knew all about him. He'd walked for three years. The earthly side of me says, as the son of God, kick him out. Get rid of him. Get him off the team. But that's not Jesus. You know what he was doing? I think for some of us as leaders and some of us as parents and some of us as friends, some of us as colleagues, he was letting us know that when we form teams and we sow into people that sometimes betrayal will come and hurt will come from those that love us most. And that shouldn't stop you washing their feet. And that shouldn't stop you welcoming them. And that shouldn't stop you doing all that you're intended to do. For maybe their betrayal will be the exact thing that pursues you into your purpose. Got some footage of the garden. Daniel, can you put that slide up? The garden. This is the olive grove. You can pause it there. I'm going to pick it up in Mark chapter 14, verse 32. It says, Then Jesus led his disciples to an orchard called the oil press. And he told them, Sit here while I pray a while. And he took Peter, Jacob, and John with him. An intense feeling of great horror plunged his soul with deep sorrow and agony. And he said to them, my heart is overwhelmed with anguish and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and watch with me. So you know the end is near. And so you say to your three closest friends, come with me, please. You read a little bit before that, you'll know that it's close to midnight. They've had the full, we'll have the full Passover meal um, on Friday night, they're, they're full to the brim and some of them have drunk a lot of cups of wine. And they're coming to the end of this Passover celebration, this very last meal. And they get to this moment. And Jesus says, please come with me. And they come with him. And he says, you stay here. And he goes on a little further and his friends fall asleep. How do you feel? Like, I'm in anguish here. Are you kidding me? And you look. Oh, we're with you, Jesus. We're with you till the end. And he looks over. And they're asleep. And he says, watch and pray. And they're exhausted. And he goes through this alone. Many commentators would say that the real battle that Jesus would fight would be right here. This is where he would kneel in that olive grove and pray. If, it, if there's another way, if there's another way, and then he would say, but not my will, yours be done. And as he's there in this olive grove, the actual word Gethsemane means it's an olive press. Literally, the olives would be collected and put into a big kind of round cement apparatus. I don't know the correct term. And there'd be some grinding would be done and then they would be taken and they would be put into baskets. And they would be put underneath a huge press. A press would be kind of, it looks like kind of a, a column, a stone column. The scripture would say that you and I were the press. Our sin was the press. 
And as the olives were put underneath this big press, the oil would come out. The precious oil would drip down and would be collected. Olive oil. The place of pressing. The scripture says that he would sweat droplets of blood as he would begin in anguish. You're like, well, that's a bit far-fetched. And even as I um, did some research, it says, though rare, the phenomenon of hemat- hematidrosis, I've said that wrong, but you get the idea. Sweating blood is well documented. Under great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can break, thus mixing blood with sweat. This process could have marked weakness and possibly shock. This was not a Jesus who wasn't feeling this. This isn't a Jesus who wasn't full of emotion and full of anguish. He felt it all, friends. He felt the weight of your sin and of mine. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy. a.m. sacrifice and the 3 p.m. sacrifice and Jesus coming to declare that I am the sacrifice for your sin. What's the story behind your story? If someone came down and looked at the context of your world and your life, what's the story behind the story? Because it might just be written that every Sunday they went out of their garage, shut the garage, got in the car, came to church. It seems like they got involved. They taught their kids to read the Bible and to pray. And then they did it all again the next week. That might be how it reads on the surface. But what's the story behind the story? My prayer today is that this story of the love of God and the passion of Jesus, that you would see that the story behind His story is the greatest love story of all time. That He loved you so much. Go ahead, put your name there. God loves. He loves you so much. that he would send his son I'm not apologizing for any tears this morning this story again this week has had me wrecked how long has it been since you had a fresh look at the sacrifice of Jesus for your sin and it broke your heart. Trust me, I know Sunday is coming. Oh, and I'm glad. But I don't think every once in a while it hurts to take a fresh look at the guilt you should have worn. Thank you. I don't think it hurts to take a fresh look at this love of God that is so rich and pure that it's measureless, the unconditional love of God that goes beyond all that I can think, all that I can imagine. It reaches into the future. It reaches into where you will be, not even to where you are. It goes on ahead. This love of God. 
just takes a look. Just one look. John would say, behold. The word behold means take a look. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away the sin of the world. I know it's not real popular these days to talk about sin. When you talk about the definition of sin, sin is where we disobey God. Whether it's from our wrongdoing or whether it's just ignoring what His instruction was to do. And the Scripture says on the Roman road that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. There isn't anyone here that could stand here and say, I am spotless and blameless. There is only one. And his name was Jesus. And so that's why when he went to the cross, as that spotless lamb of God, just like those paschal lambs would be sacrificed at the Passover, they had to be spotless and without blemish. And Jesus would come. If you have the cup and the bread, would you stand this morning? we hold the cup and the bread on that day in that room, in that upper room, he would look to the disciples and he would declare a different covenant to the one that they had celebrated their whole life. And we'll talk about that on Friday. And he would say, this bread, this is my body, which is broken for you. Don't lose the for you. This is my body, which was broken for George, Jesus would say. This is my body, Jesus would say, that is broken for Henry. This is my body, which is broken for. You go ahead and you can put your name right in there. Broken so that you might be made whole. As you take the bread, Would you thank him this morning? And then he would say, this is, this cup represents my my blood. We're going to get to Passover On Friday, you'll know that this cup, the third cup, was called the cup of redemption. And this great redeemer would hold this cup. For you. Would you go ahead and drink it, thanking Jesus for his perfect sacrifice.